Hey everybody, it's the Austin Travis County EMS System Office of the Chief Medical Officer. I'm your host, the EMS System Medical Director and Chief Deputy, Dr. J.R. Pickett. And today I have with me a very special guest, a teacher, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend, Dr. Spence Green, toxicologist extraordinaire. Now, you think that living and being a toxicologist in Houston, Texas, you might know something about snake bites. Uh, and Spence reached out. He saw that we had had a rash of snake bites here in Austin recently and said, hey, um, you're doing it wrong. Uh, so I'm, I'm here because uh, I want to hear everything that Spence uh, has to say about snake bites. He pretty much everything having to do with talks. I always uh, go to him first and, and talk with him. So Spence, thanks so much for joining me and I uh, appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks for having me. There's nothing I like more than to talk about snake bites. Uh, well, uh, that uh, then I mean that means you're doing something wrong somewhere uh, in there. Uh, now we've got uh, now we have some sort of cobra on the loose. Is that is that what I understand? Yeah. So I don't know the person who owned it, and I've heard two stories. Whether you know it, that it's a forest cobra or it's abandoned cobra, uh, I do know that the message that's being relayed by the parks department that we have no anti venom for it is incorrect because we have actually several products that are effective for either of those species. And I've treated both of those envenomations. I just don't know which one's on the loose because, you know, I'm relying on media that sometimes conflict. And honestly, I've been busy the last two days. I haven't been able to research this uh, enough myself. But yeah, there's something out there and heaven forbid someone gets bitten, we can treat it. So if you see a, a poisonous snake, I mean, granted, cobras are not endemic here, so hopefully we don't have a whole lot of them running around, but you see a cobra, you see a, a copperhead, a, a western diamondback, a uh, cottonmouth, anything like that, um, grab it, pick it up, put it in a, in a pillowcase, um, bring it to the hospital with you. Is that is that right? Or, you know, wrap it around your neck, like wear it like a boa. No, so, <laughs> so we have basically, if you will, we can break it down to two types of envenomations. We have envenomations from native snakes, and we have envenomations from snakes that are kept in collection. Now, ideally, the snakes that are kept in captivity never escape and therefore don't bite anyone uh, unsuspecting. You know, we do get tons of non-native bites because here in Texas, in most jurisdictions, it's perfectly legal to own these, these animals as long as you have your $20 permit uh, from Walmart. There are a few places where you may not own them. Uh, people still do, but, you know, it's illegal. But because most of the state allows this, I actually treat a fair amount of these non-native snake envenomations. Maybe 30, 40 a year I get called about, and I probably see about half of them at the bedside. So for those snakes, we generally know the identity because people get bit by a single snake while they're feeding it or providing some sort of health check or whatever. For those, we need to know the identity so we can give the specific antivenom. But for our native snakes, we really don't need to know the identity. Now, I will say two things. One, we like to know the identity for epidemiological purposes. Um, and I do like when people bring in, unofficially, I like when people bring in a live snake because I think it's awesome. My official stance is do not bring in the snake, uh, dead or alive. Dead because you've killed a snake that I love, and also because a dead snake can still envenomate. You know, there are a number of cases of people getting serious envenomations following a bite from a decapitated snake. And there was a guy in South Dakota uh, who got bit by a prairie rouse snake that had been decapitated, and he died from that envenomation. So I don't want you bringing the snake dead or alive. If you can quickly and safely take a picture of the snake, awesome. But you know what? Ultimately, we don't, we do not have to know the species because among our native snakes, we have two types. We have our coral snakes, which are the only native elapids in the Western hemisphere. Um, and you know, there's three species in the United States. We only have one here in Texas. Or we have our pit vipers, which are our cottonmouths, our copperheads, our rattlesnakes. And a pit viper envenomation is a clinical diagnosis. It's really easy for someone who knows anything about snake bites to distinguish a pit viper envenomation from a coral snake envenomation or from a bite from a non-venomous snake. If you see the clinical features of a pit viper envenomation, you don't have to know the species because the treatment's the same, irrespective of the species. So yeah, don't bring in the snake. If you can take a picture, awesome, but don't, don't waste time. Don't risk yourself or anybody else to get that picture. Just bring the patient in and we'll take care of the patient by looking at what's in front of us. I was going to ask you, you know, I know you love snakes and uh, because you know so much about them, uh, how does the rest of the ER staff feel about it when a patient brings a snake into the, in the emergency department, potentially a poisonous one or a, a so, venomous one rather? Uh, it's 50-50. Uh, I've had nurses uh, have panic attacks. I literally had one of my colleagues go hide somewhere and have a little mental breakdown. I have some colleagues who love snakes and they're as excited as I am. And uh, 
you know, they're always resentful that they have other patient care responsibilities because they would rather just spend the time with the snake. And that's why, like, I like when you bring the snake in when I'm consulting because I have the time to play with that snake. But if you bring it in during an ED shift, I'm too busy. And it's like, ah, oh, it's frustrating. I want to play with the snake. Um, so, yeah, I, I have colleagues who love snakes. I have colleagues who are deathly afraid of snakes and, you know, a few colleagues who just don't care either way. Well, on behalf of the of your colleagues that I'm somewhere in the middle, like I don't hate snakes. I love snakes. They, you know, they're essentially the environment and and uh, and the ecosystem and so forth. I want snakes to do their thing. I I do my thing. They do their thing. And I admire from a distance. And okay. on behalf of all those people, please do not try to capture a snake and yes. bring it in. Yeah, uh, don't don't bring the snake. Yeah, that's uh, terrible. So let's uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, clinical features of, of, of each, and then I want to uh, I want to ask you about some of the myths and and some of the the sort of like mnemonics and stuff that I've heard okay. uh, that it doesn't sound like uh, that all of those are true. So um, so I'm out there minding my own business, walking the trail, and here's this cotton mouth, and he just starts chasing after me. Uh, what do I do? Uh, Tell yourself that you're probably not looking at a cotton mouth because there's one of the myths. Cotton mouths are not aggressive. Cotton mouths want to be left alone. And there's actually a good study showing that even if you like harass the cotton mouth, their first instinct is just to try to get away. They are not aggressive. In fact, that's the thing. Most of these snakes, if you're even next to them, they're not going to do anything to you. Most bites happen. And this is one of the things that most people don't get. Most bites happen when you inadvertently step on or near a snake or you stick your hand like into the snake's vicinity. These snakes are not attacking you. They're reacting defensively. I would have no problem standing right next to a coral snake as long as I didn't harass it. These are like the laziest animals ever. They're not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna watch them uh, and they're gonna watch me. So if you see a snake, just give it some space. You know, they're not gonna come after you. They, they realize they're not gonna eat you. There's no incentive for them to interact with you. They know it's probably not gonna be in their best interest. Um, so if you see a snake, just walk away, take a picture, admire from a distance. I've heard this before that most snake bites are in young males and alcohol's involved and it's uh, because they're they're not messing all. with the snake. No, yep. is that not the so case? We always we always talk about these apocryphal risk factors and over the years we've accumulated enough of them to call them the 12 T's. You know, testosterone, 20 something, tequila, trailer park, teasing, you know, tattoos, toothlessness. But you know what, as much as it is to, you know, as much fun as it's to talk about this, that's not the case. So I published, well, I was one of the co-authors uh, of an article that came out a few years ago looking at the epidemiology of snake bites in general. We found that only 19% of bites were the result of intentionally interacting with the snake. Most were unlucky victims. And while the majority were males, it was a small majority. And as for alcohol, there was a study out of Dallas that found that fewer than 1% of envenomations were associated with concomitant alcohol or drug use, less than 1%. Most of the time, people are just minding their own business when they inadvertently get into the snake space. You know, people who are outdoors are obviously at greater risk, but most people who are outdoors are never going to encounter a snake, uh, certainly not in a dangerous sort of situation. But yeah, you know, we, we love joking about those risk factors. They're just not true. Most people are just unlucky victims. And if I could tell you one thing to prevent snake bites is to wear appropriate footwear when you're walking in snake endemic areas. You know, if you're, especially at nighttime when you can't see as well, if you're outside walking your dog at night wearing flip flops, at some point you'll probably get bitten. I've had 43 bites this year, I think. I don't know the exact numbers. And all but six of them were foot bites. And all of them were wearing, all but one, were wearing sandals or flip flops or Crocs. There was one kid who was wearing sneakers and he got bit on the ankle just above the sneaker. Everyone else had something open toed. One of my, I had seven bites uh, last weekend. And one of them was a 21 year old who was wearing open toed high heels uh, and she got bit right on the toe. And that's one of two reasons I don't wear high heels um, because I don't want that to happen. Only two reasons? <laughs> I think two is enough. Uh, they look silly and, I, and I'd fall over and get bitten. So. so you talked about clinical features of, uh, of snake bites. Let's first talk about the crotalids uh, and venomations and what are those clinical features? What, how do I know that this is a real bite rather than a dry bite? Okay. So. Let's just say what a dry bite is. A dry bite means there are no venom effects. And one of the things that really bugs me is when our emergency medicine colleagues will have a patient in front of them with like swelling and bruising and pain, but the labs are normal. So then they'll tell the patients a dry bite. That is insane. A dry bite means there are no venom effects. And dry bites are such a small percentage of total bites. You know, people will tell you incorrectly, oh, well, half of bites are dry. No, that's ridiculous. Fewer than 10 to 15% of snake bites from our crotalids are dry. 85, 90% of the time, 
or more, there's going to be venom effects. Now, it may be a minimal envenomation, but if they have swelling and bruising, that's a venom effect. If they have you know, lab abnormalities, if they have systemic toxicity, that's a venom effect. So what are the clinical features of crotal envenomations? What we see is a lot of swelling and we get a lot of bruising. We see some duskiness. Um, sometimes we don't see the fang marks. You know, oftentimes an envenomation is from a single fang because pit vipers have such long mobile fangs, they can strike you with just a single fang. And all, oftentimes that mark is obscured by the swelling. So crotalid, whether it's copperhead, cottonmouth, rattlesnake, you'll get swelling, you'll get bruising, you'll get like a sheen to the skin as it's stretched. And what you don't see is a lot of redness. You see a lot more, you know, duskiness and bruising than actual redness. And, you know, I've seen these so many times. I've treated over a thousand bites. I, you know, it, there's nothing to me that looks like a snake bite. Like you see something, like, oh, that's totally a snake bite. I was leaving work a few days ago and one of my nursing colleagues was like, hey, we have a, a bite for you. And I walk in and I was all excited. I'm like, this isn't a bite. This is an abscess. And then like, I pressed on the foot, like all this pus came pouring out. Not a snake bite. It, it really, it just doesn't look anything like a pit viper bite. So that's what we see from our crotalids. Irrespective of species, you know, on average, a rattlesnake bite is worse. Copper and cottonmouth are equivalent. But the important thing to remember is that any pit viper bite can be minimal, mild, moderate, severe, or even fatal. And we've had fatalities from every uh, one of our species in Texas, you know, including the most recent one was actually a timber rattlesnake, like in the last few weeks. We had a cottonmouth fatality last year. We had, uh, I don't know if we've had a copperhead death in Texas, but there have been six in the country in the last 33 years. So. So if, uh, if I happen to be walking outside in my flip-flops and I uh, get tagged by a timber rattler or a Mexican green rattler or something like that, uh, <laughs> is, it, is it time for me just to take my cyanide pill and like, that, that's it, you know, I'm done, uh, I'm, I'm doomed, <laughs> this is, no, uh, this you, is it you for me? No, you've got a family that cares about you, so no. I mean, realize death is highly unlikely. You know, there's an average of 3.4 fatalities per year in the United States from our native snakes. And oftentimes it's people who don't seek medical attention. One of the papers I authored last year looked at this and, you know, many of the bites were in the setting of a religious ceremony where they didn't seek medical attention afterward because God would provide. Death is highly unlikely, but tissue injury is very likely. And if you go untreated, you can have prolonged or even permanent disability. So heaven forbid you get tagged, remain calm because you'll probably be okay. You just have to do the proper things, which means getting to an appropriate medical facility as quickly as possible and not doing anything dangerous in between. You know, you get bit on the hand or the foot. You wanna stop what you're doing. You wanna call 911 or someone who can get to the hospital. I say you wanna get to the hospital as quickly as possible. If that means calling a friend and you're clinically stable, that's fine. If you're not, you wanna get medicine to you. So call 911. You don't wanna drive yourself because you know, you won't be able to focus and, and you may get more sick and you may have swelling that interferes with your ability to operate a car. So never get yourself to the hospital, but get yourself to the hospital as quickly as possible. So what do you do? You call for help. You remove anything tight, whether it's jewelry or clothing. If you're able to, and this is what we talked about, you want to elevate the affected extremity. You know, for years, people thought that you should keep the affected limb below heart level. And that was based on the assumption that, you know, Elevating the affected extremity would increase the systemic absorption of venom. But we know that the volume of venom is so insignificant and it really doesn't make a difference. What we also know is that there's a ton of swelling that comes from our native crotalids and that elevation makes them feel better faster and reduces tissue injury. We've known this for years and now we have data because last year data uh, were presented at the North American Congress of Clinical Toxicology showing that elevation reduces the swelling, reduces the pain, and people get better faster. That's why I'm such a big proponent of elevating the affected limb. So you want to elevate the affected extremity, and you want to avoid the stupid things that people have done in the past. Tourniquets. Tourniquets are great for life-threatening bleeding, terrible for snake bites, where we have tissue injury in almost every envenomation, and oftentimes that's the only thing we have. A tourniquet is going to make the tissue injury much worse. Even a constriction band or a pressure immobilization, you're going to make the tissue injury much worse. And ironically, if you do the pressure immobilization wrong, you'll also increase systemic absorption simultaneously. Um, we don't want to use the extraction devices that are sold in all these camping stores and sporting goods stores because they don't remove venom. They actually cause a negative pressure injury. And a, a bunch of us are actually involved in a public awareness campaign to get them off the market. Uh, you don't want to use electrical therapy. I can't believe how often I actually have to have this conversation with people. They'll actually say, oh, well, we'll use, use a stun gun or a taser and you can neutralize the venom. No, what you do is you neutralize the victim. You cause a local injury and occasionally kill the person. It doesn't help with envenomation. 
You know, I know it's cool in a Tarantino sort of way to hook your friend up to a car battery, but it's not going to help the bite. Um, yeah. I, I mean, and, I've, well, I've felt a taser before. I'm, I'm not sure that's better than a snake bite. Yeah. <laughs> like it so does not all, feel good at all. All these things that have been proposed in the past have been shown to be useless at best, dangerous at worst. And let me just say one thing about ice. So ice is a, is a controversial one. I have a lot of friends who've been envenomated, and they tell me that ice packs make them feel better. The problem is prolonged ice packs or cold packs can damage the tissue. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to do an ice pack for a few minutes, you know, an ice pack wrapped in a towel, five minutes on, 10 minutes off. That's okay. That's not going to cause any injury. Prolonged ice will definitely cause injury. So we don't do that. But only the best thing is get to a facility, get to an appropriate facility. And that's the thing I want to emphasize because here in Texas, almost every hospital carries antivenom. Very few hospitals have someone who really knows what he or she is doing. And I hate to say this, but it's true. Most hospitals don't manage bites correctly. Even though we've had, you know, the unified treatment algorithm around for 10 years, even though we have tons of evidence of what to do, what not to do, we have a randomized clinical trial showing that copperhead bites should be treated. Most hospitals just for whatever reason, whether it's financial or a lack of education or what, they don't treat bites according to the medical literature. And it's frustrating. So you want to go to a place where you have a snake bite expert or at least someone who knows what he or she is doing. Now, if I'm an EMS provider and I've, uh, I've I've got my patient here and they say they got tagged by a snake, there's some swelling, there's some bruising, they're in a lot of pain. Uh, yep. So uh, every reason to suspect that this was a, a legitimate en uh, envenomation like a cr uh, by a rattlesnake or something along those lines. Um, what, uh, as an advanced life support provider, uh, what are what are my options? What do I like to do? Okay, so, you know, our approach to managing a snake bite is no different from managing any other patient. We focus on A, B, C, D, E. So airway, breathing, circulation, those are straightforward. You want to make sure you get IV access in the unaffected extremity. Uh, a few days ago, I actually had a bite transfer to me with an IV in the same arm as the bite. And I was like, really? That's poor form. So airway, breathing, circulation. Fortunately, airway and breathing aren't usually an issue. Uh, if they are either because of a severe envenomation, which is unlikely, or an allergic reaction to venom, which is even more unlikely. You know. To, to have an allergic reaction to venom, you have to have been sensitized to venom previously. So that's really, really uncommon. Give them uh, epinephrine if there's evidence of an allergic reaction, uh, supplement oxygen, secure the airway if you have to, give them fluids to maintain perfusion. After that, it's all about D&E, which is disability and expose. Um, give them pain medicine. You know, one of the things that's so debilitating about a bite disease hurts, so parenteral opioids. Uh, and then E can also be elevate. Um, while you expose the affected extremity. You want to mark the progression of the, the local injury and then just go to the right place, you know? I was reading the uh, Joint Trauma System guidelines on snake bites, and when they talked about elevation, they were talking about like 60 degrees, like yeah. really elevating the heck out yeah. of the extremity. To properly elevate the affected limb, you want to have the affected limb at at least like 45, 50, ideally 60 degrees or more with the most distal part as high as possible with a little bit... Uh, to no bend in the elbow or knee. What you don't want is, you know, the arm, I don't know if you can see, bent like this, because then all the fluids accumulate in the elbow. You want it straight, you know, almost like you're you're reaching for the part where the ceiling meets the wall. You know, you're reaching up to the corner of the room. So in the hospital, I have these awesome uh, foam pillows that are made for uh, rehab patients that does a perfect job. Uh, I'm not gonna name the company because they haven't given me a sponsorship deal yet, but as soon as uh, I have an arrangement with them, then I will, gladly promote their product but yeah i have this awesome pillow this side pillow. note if you work for that company dr green is willing to discuss <laughs> options well I'm, I'm trying to get them to be one of the sponsors <laughs> for the houston venom conference so you know we'll see what happens uh hopefully i'll know in the next week or so but um in the pre-hospital environment it's tough you know the best thing you use pillows and blankets i guess because in an ambulance you have a ceiling you could actually like tie a little rope or something and just use like some prolex to support the wrist and that can help keep the arm in the perfect position. Um, we don't have that advantage in the hospital where the roof, you know, where the ceiling's so much higher, uh, it would be impractical, but we have those awesome pillows there. But yeah, the bottom line is you want to elevate because they get better faster and they'll feel better faster. I honestly believe elevation is the second most important thing you can do for most pit viper bites following, uh, you know, antivenom, which is the definitive treatment. Now I will say for coral sinks, which account for no more than 10% of our bites in Texas and fewer than 2% of bites in the country, where we, you know, with coral snakes, we don't worry about tissue injury. There's no tissue damage. For those people, I do whatever feels best for them. If they want to elevate their leg or arm, fine. If they want to keep it at heart level, fine. If they want to keep it below, fine. We're not worried about tissue injury. We're not worried about swelling. Uh, we're just worried about pain control. And if you're in Florida, 
more significant neuro stuff, but we don't always see the significant weakness in Texas. We see occasional objective findings like ptosis or whatever, but in Texas and in Arizona, you don't really see the skeletal respiratory muscle paralysis that people fear about coral snakes. Um, you know, coral snakes, there's a lot of myths about them because they're, they're so infrequent. People, you know, they think they know about them, but they don't. Let me tell you, they hurt. They hurt a ton, especially in Southeast Texas, but that's it. We don't see anything beyond the pain and paresthesias uh, in Southeast Texas and in North and Central Texas, some objective stuff that's not worrisome. Now, when it comes to coral snakes, we've all heard the rhyme, right? Uh, red next to black, venom lack, red next to yellow kill a fellow, whatever that, uh, uh, what that, whatever that is. And I, I see you trying to stomp this out yes. on Nip social media. Yes. yes. Uh, tell me why. I'm not the only one. So there's two problems with the rhyme. One, although it's frequently correct, it's not always correct. It is neither sensitive nor specific because there are especially in Texas, there's a lot of aberrant coral snakes where they don't have the typical red, yellow, black pattern. And people may think, oh, well, because the red's not touching yellow, that's not a coral snake. And then they end up getting envenomated. Uh, conversely, there are snakes, not so much where we are, but west of us, where red touches yellow and it's a completely harmless snake, like the shovel nose snake. So it's neither sensitive nor specific. The other problem is, even if it were 100% sensitive and specific, which it isn't, people sometimes remember the rhyme incorrectly. They'll get it wrong. They'll, they'll start playing around the words and get the order wrong. And then they'll say, oh, well, that's a harmless snake. And you know, a few years ago, I had to treat a boy scout who was told by his scout masters that the snake he encountered was harmless because they recited the rhyme incorrectly. They said it backward. So he picked up the coral snake, got bitten, started screaming in pain. And some other scout comes and goes, why is he holding a coral snake? So people remember the rhyme incorrectly and mnemonics are useless if you can't remember them. So a better rule of thumb is if you don't know snakes really well, just leave it alone. That's the PG version of that, of that rule. Um, so yeah, we don't like the rhyme because it's not always right. And even if it's right, if you don't remember it correctly, bad things can happen. I like that rule. I yeah, can send you a picture of that kid with leave the, the snake alone uh, for treating the pit viper envenomation. Uh, you, you mentioned pain control, like opiates, fentanyl, catamine, whatever, uh, that, uh, that you have available there for treating pain. Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, Benadryl? What's your thoughts on, uh, uh volume expansion? Like okay. crystalloids. So let's talk about crystalloids. It's really important to maintain euvolemia. And one of the reasons people can get really sick from a pit viper bite is, you know, volume depletion, you know, because of third space and, and losses from GI, if they have vomiting or diarrhea or whatever. So it's really important to establish IV access and give fluids, um, maintain perfusion. I think theoretically you could give too much fluid if they're hemodynamically stable and you just start pouring in fluids because think about it, they have leaky capillary following a snake bite. And where do you think all that fluid is going to go once you've established, you know, euvolemia? I think theoretically that fluid can go into the limb. So while it's important to get IV access and, you know, support circulation, I think it's, you know, potentially dangerous to give way too much fluid. So be careful. As for Benadryl, one of those things that circulates on the internet and everything, Benadryl will do nothing helpful for an envenomation itself, okay? Histamine is not a major player in what we see in our pit viper bites, and giving an antihistamine doesn't provide a benefit. People still recommend it. People who don't know snake bites recommend it, and it's really common in the veterinary world, but there's no science to support it. In fact, Reuters specifically, you know, addressed this issue. They, uh, they looked at the research, they talked to experts, and, you know, they've been making a big deal out of this you know, snake bites are not treated with Benadryl. Now, is Benadryl ever beneficial? Yeah, in two situations, an allergic reaction to either the uh, venom, which again is exceptionally uncommon, or if they were to get an allergic reaction, a mild allergic reaction to the antivenom, which is still pretty uncommon. You know, if you look at the safety data for CROFAB, the last paper out of Arizona was a 1.4% incidence of adverse reaction. So Benadryl is helpful for a mild allergic reaction. It, it won't do anything for, you know, anaphylaxis. You, you need to treat anaphylaxis with epinephrine. So Benadryl is helpful for that. And then sometimes we'll give kids with bites Benadryl, not because it's doing anything for the bite whatsoever, but because sometimes these kids are wild and crazy as kids tend to be. And at some point they need to go to bed for their sake and for their parents' sake and for the nursing sake. So we give Benadryl to go night night. It won't help with the bite itself, but it'll help with the overall patient care. But Benadryl for an envenomation itself, there's no point. It doesn't make a difference. It's And Theoretically, it could cloud the picture. If you give someone Benadryl, they get sleepy, then they can't provide a good history. 
Um, it also could potentially provide a false sense of security if people think, oh, well, I can just give them Benadryl. No, you can't. The treatment is antivenom, or at least monitoring to see if they need antivenom. You can't just take a Benadryl and be fine because that's not how it works. So if I'm uh, if I'm an EMS provider, I'm called out to scene. The person says, I got bitten by a snake. I'm not sure what kind it was. I think it may have been a, a one of these pit vipers. I don't know them that well. Um, and you're looking at this and there is nothing like maybe maybe there's a fang mark or two but there's no bruising there's no swelling there's no significant pain um do they still warrant immediate transport to the hospital or or can we say well you know why don't we do some watchful waiting and and uh, uh call us back if if uh, yeah. if you get any symptoms that's a great question we recommend they still get observed because as i said before most bites are m most bites from venomous snakes will not be dry most of them will result in envenomation at some point. Um, of course, a bite from a non-venomous snake isn't worrisome, but if you don't know what the species is, assume the worst. The problem is, or the thing is, snake bites are dynamic. Just because something looks fine at first doesn't mean an hour from now, two, three, four, five hours from now, they won't be much more significant. If you look at the unified treat treatment algorithm, the recommendation for a suspected dry bite is still to observe for eight hours. And I can tell you from my own practice, I've had a guy come in after a a bite from a rattlesnake who had no signs and symptoms and his labs were fine. His exam was fine, but we did the right thing. We watched him for eight hours and we repeated the labs like a little bit before eight hours. And I got a phone call from the lab the same time I got a phone call from the nurse. The lab called back and said his labs, which had been totally normal the first time around, um, started going all the wrong direction. And at the same time, there's like, hey, his arm is beginning to swell. And I went to see him and yeah, he had swelling and bruising where he had not had any for the previous few hours. And over the next day or so, he got worse because that's, and, you know, he ultimately got treated, of course. But that's what happens. Bites that look insignificant at first can get much worse. Uh, do they all need to go to the emergency department right away? I think they should because, you know, you may see lab abnormalities before you see any clinical effects. Uh, and they can decompensate quickly. I suppose if you had someone who lived close by who was perfectly reasonable and responsible and had a, a ride, you know, you could say, well, you know, let's see if anything happens. And, you know, especially these days with the hospital being so full, perhaps there's a role for that or perhaps there's a role for, you know, getting checked on by EMS again. But right now we recommend that a bite from any potentially venomous snake gets monitored and observed for eight hours from the time of the bite. And you mentioned lab abnormalities. What, what kind of things do we see with uh, labs? What are some of those like systemic effects from the pit viper envenomations? Okay. So yeah, a pit fiber inflammation, there's three things we worry about. We worry about the local tissue injury, which we see in almost all these cases. And in often, in, in most cases, that's all we see. Um, we can see systemic toxicity, which could include difficulty breathing, refractory vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, and we can see hematologic lab abnormalities. And the labs that I care about are low fibrinogen, elevated prothrombin time, and thrombocytopenia. Lab abnormalities are pretty common but clinically significant lab abnormalities are fortunately very rare and medically significant bleeding is really, really rare. There's one paper uh, years ago that showed that medically significant bleeding only occurs in 0.5% of bites. Some other studies have su suggested the incidence a little bit higher, maybe even up to 5%. But still, most people will not have medically significant bleeding, but they may have the lab abnormalities that predispose them to that. So they need to be monitored and often treated. Uh, what about things like uh, renal failure or rhabdomyolysis? Rhabdo is really uncommon. I, I check CKs on all my bites now, and they're almost never elevated. And certainly, they're not elevated uh, to any great extent. Now, of course, I'm treating primarily copperheads. Even when I was in rattlesnake country, when I worked in Arizona, when I trained in Arizona, we didn't see rhabdo a lot. And I can tell you, compartment syndrome is something that's really, really, really rare. You know, they always talk about it in, say, step two for the boards. And a lot of you know, curricula will talk about how you have to worry about compartment syndrome. I've treated over a thousand bites. I've been called on over several thousand bites. I've never seen a true compartment syndrome. I've seen people think they had compartment syndrome. I've seen doctors do fasciotomies for what they thought was a compartment syndrome, but there's never been any objective evidence uh, that there's a compartment syndrome. Uh, DIC, same thing. We don't really see DIC uh, with snake bites. What you can see sometimes is VICC, which is similar, but different mechanism. And even that is really, really rare. And that's the venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy. Um, but, and for pre-hospital care, you know, the whole concern for compartment syndrome is really insignificant, but even in the hospital, it's important to know that if there's a true compartment syndrome, which again, you'll probably never see in your career, even if it does exist, it's a marker of the badness, but it's not responsible for the badness. So you treat it not by doing surgical intervention, but by treating with more antivenom 
because the elevated compartment pressures are indicative of a bad envenomation that needs to be treated with antivenom. If you just relieve the elevated pressures, but you don't treat the envenomation, the muscle still dies. But if you treat the envenomation with the antivenom, then the pressures will normalize. But pre hospitally you know, there's nothing to do about that besides elevation and pain control. So for the pit viper bites, uh, my patient gets bit and they've, they're definitely symptomatic. They're going to the hospital, they're getting a- antivenom. Um, what, uh, what's expected hospital course? How long do they typically stay in hospital and, uh, and you know, issues like pain or, you know, anything post, post-procedure post issues like that? What do you see? Yeah, so most pit viper bites really only need to spend a day, maybe two in the hospital. You know, the course of antivenom, with some exceptions, is you know, the initial dose and they may get some maintenance dosing. I can tell you 99% of my St. My victims are out of the hospital within 24 hours because there's no real advantage to staying in the hospital beyond that. Um, some people will require prolonged course of antivenom and some will be just systemically ill. So they'll need other medical issues addressed. But, you know, if you treat them early and aggressively, you can hopefully avoid all the sequelae of a bad untreated bite, which can include multi-organ failure and, you know, significant pain. You know, most people will be out of the hospital in a day or two. I think it's important to know that once you go home, you still have to do a few things to help yourself get better faster. We continue elevation for a few days. You know, if you're a bit on the leg, we keep the leg propped up on one of those fancy pillows and we encourage people not to bear weight for a few days and until they feel better. You know, I've seen some patients get discharged um, and told, oh, we'll start walking on it. I've actually seen some children's hospitals saying that they won't let the kid go home until they can bear weight on it. But and they'll force these kids to walk on these painful, swollen legs. I think that's terrible. My bites, they don't put weight on it for four, five, six days. Uh, that's, that's my instruction. Or even longer until the swelling is really improved. The good thing is if you treat them aggressively with antivenom, usually within a few days, they are able to bear weight without discomfort. I had, again, seven bites this past weekend. And one of them was a kid who got bit on the ankle. And you know he got treated with antivenom within a few hours. I watched him overnight. And he went home. And he went home on Sunday, I think. And on Thursday, yesterday, his dad was like, oh, yeah, he's feeling great now. He's running on it again. That's such a success story. You know what? We don't see that in people who don't get treated with antivenom. We see that in people who get treated appropriately and quickly. The people who go untreated, they often have weeks, sometimes longer, with pain and swelling. And some people will have permanent post-exertional swelling. You know, I remember this one young woman. She was a triathlete. That was her hobby. And she had a significant bite with swelling from her toe to her thigh. And at the hospital, they didn't treat her because it was a copper bite. And you still see that sometimes. People say, oh, well, it's a copper. We don't have to treat. And that's nonsense. She has pain and swelling anytime she stands for long periods. She certainly can't run, and she absolutely can't run competitively. That snake bite changed the course of her life. And you know what? Had she been treated aggressively with antivenom, she'd probably be fine. She'd probably be able to do the things she used to love to do. It's really unfortunate. That's too bad. Uh, so for pre-hospital care, pit viper, um, ch- take care of the ABCs, uh, expose uh, the the limb, elevate the limb, throw an IV in them, make sure that they're euvolemic, so volume resuscitate as needed, give yep. pain medication, don't worry about the Benadryl, don't put on a tourniquet, don't wrap it in some like constricting bandage or anything uh, of that nature and get them to some place that has uh, antivenom that knows what they're doing. Right. Um, and if you can quickly and safely take a picture of the snake, great. Otherwise, don't delay transport. Yeah, you nailed it. That's exactly what you do for a snake bite. It's really simple. Now, let's talk about the coral snakes. So right. the lapids. Uh, so neurotoxic, a little bit different uh, presentation. What do we do for those pre-hospital setting and, and then in hospital? So airway, breathing, circulation, pain control, you know, especially in southeast Texas. So I'll, I'll say one of my research interests is the geographic variation in the coral snake envenomations. And it seems like in South and Central, pardon me, South and East Texas, the bites are really painful, like you're, like you're being tased. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for me to give someone a few hundred mics of fentanyl in the first hour, even little kids. So these are really painful. These are probably the second most painful things I treat behind uh, widow spider envenomations. So pain control. In North and Central Texas, they don't seem to be as painful, but they have some more objective stuff. Nothing worrisome, like no skeletal or respiratory muscle paralysis, but they do have things like ptosis or dysphagia, dysphonia, et cetera. So airway, breathing, circulation, pain control, and that's pretty much it. You know, position them however they feel most comfortable. In theory, a pressure immobilization wrap would be helpful because you don't have to worry about tissue injury, 
but we do have to worry about the systemic effects. But honestly, the affected limb is usually so painful, the pressure mobilization makes it worse. And like I said before, if you do it wrong, you'll actually increase the systemic absorption. And most people just aren't trained to do it correctly. There was a paper out of California years ago showing that most people do pressure mobilization incorrectly. And because, you know, especially in Texas, we don't really see serious toxicity, just the pain, I would just leave it alone. Just go to the hospital, get pain control, and then we observe them for any objective stuff. Most of these times, these people are out of there within a day or so. They may have paresthesias that last a while. Uh, most people don't even need antivenom. And uh, we do have coral snake antivenom. There was a, a paper that came out a few years, not a paper, a newspaper story saying that there was a shortage and people couldn't get treated. And that's not true. We've never had a true shortage if you define a shortage as insufficient supply to meet the demand. It's true that they did discontinue production of the North American coral snake antivenom for a while, but we never really ran out of existing products and they have since resumed production. So we have access to coral snake antivenom if you need it. Most hospitals don't have it, but they can get it from a zoo or similar institution. And if you don't have the North American stuff, we can use some non-native products that, that work. But like I said, it's really almost never necessary in Arizona or Texas. Uh, we do use it in Florida a little more often because they are more likely to progress to actual objective weakness and uh, paralysis. What are your indications that a coral snake victim is uh, is is going downhill? We need to be more aggressive with managing them, managing the airway, et cetera. So what I do, anytime I have a suspected coral snake envenomation, knowing in my heart of hearts that nothing serious is going to happen in Texas, I keep them on entitled CO2, which I think is a better uh, marker for respiratory insufficiency than the pulse ox, which is kind of a, a delayed thing. And I'll do negative inspiratory force measurement by the respiratory therapist to see how well someone can take a big breath. You know, if we see a decrease in that, that may be suggestive of respiratory muscle paralysis. And then what I do, because I have the, the little devices everywhere, I do dynamometry. I have them squeeze as hard as they can with an unaffected extremity. That way it's not, you know, affected by pain and see how, how much grip strength they can generate. And if they have some sort of weakness, that to me tells me that they have some impending skeletal muscle problems. But like I said, in Texas, we just don't see it. Um, in Florida, and for that reason, I, I almost never give antivenom. The only time I would even consider giving antivenom in Texas is if there's something objective, um, whether it's the NIF or the dynamometry or, or ptosis, something where they clearly are having some sort of deficits. In Florida, we have a much lower threshold to treat, and I watch those people, I, I recommend watching those people much more carefully. And the second they have anything at all worrisome, they go ahead and get antivenom because they can progress to skeletal or respiratory muscle paralysis. But again, not, not really a problem in Texas. It's really about pain control and, and keeping people from doing things that are unnecessary. Uh, so after a snake bite, we have to protect the patient from the doctors is what you're saying. We really do. It's uh, <laughs> I hate to say that, but you know what? There are doctors who are not gonna treat patients who require antivenom. There's doctors that are gonna intervene surgically. There's no doctors who are gonna throw antibiotics on. You know, infection is really, really uncommon following snake bites, less than 1% of snake bites result in infection. And giving antibiotics inappropriately can cause side effects, it can contribute to resistance, it sets up this expectation that they're gonna get antibiotics anytime they get it bitten by a snake. And interestingly, there's a paper that came out last year showing that certain antibiotics can potentiate certain venom components. So not only will antibiotics cause side effects and not help with the bites, they can actually make the envenomation worse. So antibiotics should not be given prophylactically, only when there's objective evidence of an infection. And again, that's so rare. In one paper, less than 1%. In a paper with which I was involved, it was three out of 280 patients, so a little more than 1%. Um, they should not be given routinely. So yeah, we have to protect our patients from the doctors who don't know about snake bites. <laughs> <laughs> now, just uh, because there's a cobra on the loose, uh, just touching base about non-native snake species. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm my pet gaboon viper I uh, got out of his cage or, I, you know, my uh, my neighbor's rhino viper got loose or or, or whatever. Any, anything else to kind of throw out there that uh, EMS providers might want to know about? For EMS, obviously, the, the same rules apply. Just realize that they shouldn't spend time trying to find a hospital that carries antivenom because no hospitals are going to carry the non-native antivenom. Hospitals don't carry non-native products. They carry our native products, which are not useful for these snakes. Instead, they want to go to a place where they have someone who knows what he or she is doing, who can obtain the correct antivenom. Um, the pre-hospital care is the same. And of course, they shouldn't try to catch the snake themselves. Here in Texas, there are hundreds of people who volunteer their time to freely, you know, to relocate these snakes or to capture these snakes. You know, if you have a, a venomous snake that's native, 
to Texas in your property and you want it removed, you can call these people and they'll come and remove it for free. And if it's a non-native one, um, you know, they'll capture it and return it to the proper uh, person or to the authorities, you know, depending on whether it was kept legally or not, or they'll bring it to a, a zoo or something. So yeah, they shouldn't try to capture the snake themselves. They, uh, it's the same rules uh, as before, just protect themselves, do the right thing for the patient. But the actual pre-hostile management kind of depends on the species. So if it was a, a rhino viper or a goblin viper, we treat that like any other viper bites with the elevation, et cetera. If it's a cobra, it kind of depends whether it's a cobra that causes exclusively neurotoxicity versus a cobra that causes tissue injury as well. If there's any potential for tissue injury, we don't consider the pressure on mobilization and we do elevate. If it's an exclusively neurotoxic snake, we don't worry about the tissue injury. So that kind of depends on the species. You know, We see a lot of monoclonal cobra bites in Texas because it's probably the most popular uh, non-native captive, and they can cause both local tissue injury and neurotoxicity. So you have to be on, you know, to watch for those. And then of course, if you have a spitting cobra, you have to consider any potential eye injuries and just irrigate those eyes tremendously, you know, treat them like a chemical exposure. What kind of an injury does that cause? Um, you can get you know, destruction of the cornea, you know, corneal epithelium. Uh, it could theoretically penetrate more deeply. Um, so, you know, think of it like a caustic agent. I mean, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort of picture this. The snake thinks like disrespects you so much, like thinks so little of you. It's like I'm not even going to bother biting you. I'm going to spit my venom at you. That's how little I think of you. Uh, so, I mean, that's just a straight disrespectful snake, in my opinion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you're anthropomorphizing a little bit. You know, obviously, <laughs> spitting is a whole lot safer than biting. You know, it's like using a gun versus a knife. A knife is a personal sort of thing. You know, you got to have a little more confidence. Um, you know, snipers, you know, it's a whole different thing, but. <laughs> so Spence, thanks so much for talking to me about these today. I understand that you've got a conference coming up that really gets into all about envenomations and, and how to take care of that. Can you talk, talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, since 2013, I've been directing the Houston Venom Conference. Uh, we didn't have an event last year because of the pandemic and we didn't do one this year. We are you know, there's a conference in Denver on October 6th, the Denver Venom Conference, uh, which is being hosted by Nick Brandhoff. I really encourage people to go. But my event uh, for next year, uh, the Houston Venom Conference, is June 3rd and 4th, uh, 2022. The event itself, the, the actual lectures are on June 4th uh, at the Weston Hotel in the Texas Medical Center. And we're offering, hopefully, uh, CE for doctors, nurses, EMS providers, and for the first time ever, veterinarians. And we're going to have a whole day devoted uh, to envenomations of all types and how to manage them. We'll have some international experts uh, talking about snake bite management, talking about venom components and venom variability, spider envenomations. We're going to talk about you know what to do if your pet is envenomated, uh, where to go, what to do, what not to do. And one of the things I really love about the event is we have a panel toward the end of the day featuring patients and parents of patients describing their experience with the bite, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what they learned, you know, how they could have prevented it, what they know now. Uh, it's always really popular. We've done it two times in the past, and it's one of the greatest parts of the day. So, yeah, it's, it's all day on June 4th, uh, like I said, offering CE for a variety of healthcare professionals, and we'll have a reception the night before at the Houston Zoo. That's June 3rd, and uh, the website will be updated soon. It's a little uh, outdated now because we, we put a pause on it for COVID uh, and tickets will be available in a few weeks after that. So yeah, Houston Venom Conference, June 3rd and 4th in the Texas Medical Center. It's one of the largest conferences in North America devoted to envenomations and it's tailored for people at all levels of training, EMS providers, physicians, nurses, and even people who are just interested in snakes and you know herpetologists. Um, we should have about 400 people and it'll be a great day. And I understand the food's really good too. <laughs> good. Great I know the food the zoo is good. <laughs> Uh, well, fantastic. Spence, thanks so much for spending some of your morning with me here and, and uh, talking with me about these things. We will uh, we'll be updating our protocols, and um, but uh, this is great, valuable information, and uh, thanks so much for spending the time. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.